It's a great uh, privilege, it's a great honour to be with you today. I once preached at a day with Mary in Muswell Hill quite a few years ago and I've always had a huge devotion to Our Lady of Fatima whose shrine I've had the privilege to visit on a number of occasions uh, as an Anglican and it is I think to her prayers, uh, certainly I pray to her that I would one day come into the full communion as a Catholic Church and I give thanks for what I hope was her prayers to enable me to do so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pope Emeritus Benedict came out with these wonderful words about Mary. Mary's greatness consists in the fact that she wanted to magnify God, not herself. The Magnificat the words which Luke reports Mary proclaiming when she visits Elizabeth is a wondrous song of praise. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Mary is a woman filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary is a woman steeped in God. She is steeped in God's words. From this great song of praise, we see a woman completely orientated towards her Heavenly Father, open to the Spirit and pregnant with God's Word. Mary is so locked into the life of the Holy Trinity that we see her greatness even as she acknowledges her lowliness. Yes, Mary is great because she is humble, because she is lowly. She is great because God comes first. She is great because she perfectly understands the truth of what it means to be truly human. You cannot be truly human without God. You cannot be great without God. You cannot indeed be anything without God. In the Magnificat, Mary declares the greatness of God. And God is great because he is love. He is great because of the depths of his mercy. He is great because he looks down from heaven and he sees all, from the greatest to the least. And those who are truly humble, those who truly know their need of God, those who know they are nothing without him, find in him an ending source of beauty, of holiness and grace. God is great because through his Son, Heaven is thrown open, and Mary, through whom salvation is made possible, will become its queen, its centre, and its heart. Some well-meaning parents, when they speak of how they encourage their children, use the phrase, you can be whatever you want to be. Now, I truly understand the parental desire to get their children to strive for fulfillment of dreams and ambitions. Every parent wants to see their child make something of their lives. But with due respect, I think the phrase you can be whatever you want to be is wrong. First, it's simply not true. We are all made up of different gifts, abilities, talents. We all have different temperaments and characters. We have different levels of energy, different styles of learning. We all have different hopes and dreams. Therefore, it is highly unlikely that we can all be whatever we want to be. What we can do is make the best of what we are, for what we are is given to us. It is given to us by God himself, who made us in his image and likeness but who makes us in such a way as to be unique as well, the better to reflect his glory. 
Second, to say you can be whatever you want to be reflects a truly pernicious mindset that is steadily taking hold in our society and threatening to do real damage to our collective sanity. It has given rise to all our sense that we can forge an identity for ourselves, even if that identity is vastly at odds with what we know to be true about ourselves. It has given rise to fluidity about our gender identity and blurred the God-given distinction between male and female. Most recently, it has given rise to some truly bizarre situations. A 69-year-old man wishing to be reassigned and to identify as a 45-year-old. I wish we could all do that. It has given rise to a defiance of all common sense, basic logic, and some of us are weaving a world of fantasy which threatens the fabric of reality. The incarnation of Jesus, the Word made flesh, roots us in two things. It roots us in reality, that God, who is the creator of all, who forms the seas, the lands, and creatures that move upon the face of the earth, has made us in a certain way and has ordered us towards a specific end and destiny. And that destiny is worship. We worship God not because he is the ultimate narcissist who needs us to bow down before him, but because it lifts us out of ourselves and orients us, his creatures, towards the creator God who becomes part of his creation in his son, Jesus Christ. Our God is a practical God. When something went wrong with his creation, he put it right. When sin appeared, when the evil one tried to sow chaos and confusion, God became the answer, the solution to the problem, and the lamb of sacrifice that takes away sin. He did so in a practical way. He chose a woman, a lowly handmaid. He made her sinless from the moment of her conception. His spirit overshadowed her and his son took shape within her. Her sinlessness, her greatness, and her humility, her acceptance of who and what she was before God made all this possible. She didn't think that she could be whatever she wanted to be, not for her, the way of self. She quite simply did, and more importantly was, what God wanted her to be. This is what we revere and honour in Mary, full of grace and full of truth. He has looked on his servant in her loneliness, hence for all ages will call her blessed. In the Magnificat, Mary goes on to sing not only of how the lowly are exalted, but how the mighty, the proud of heart, are put down from their seats. In the face of humility, in the presence of the truly meek, pride is vanquished and hate and evil flee. This is why the devil, the proud spirit, cannot bear Mary. Of all the creatures he most hates and fears, it is Mary in her purity, in her humility, in her eternal openness and obedience to God's will, her decision once made and cemented in eternity, to bear the eternal word, the devil meets his deadliest foe. It's not as though Mary meets him in conflict hot and bitter, it's simply that the very presence of such beauty of nature, of heart and soul, is unbearable to him. It is an affront to his pride, it makes a mockery of his might and knowledge, and it casts him down because he has no answer to the gentle reproach of a nature that glorifies God rather than self. But Mary knew, too, 
that there would be pain as well as joy. She knew, because Simeon told her so, that a sort of sorrow would pierce her heart, a sorrow as cruel as any that can be felt in this world, the cruel death of her son on the cross. But that too was accepted, that too was embraced as a necessary part of God's plan. Mary teaches us so much about what it means to be a disciple, but I want to draw a couple of simple points out today. First, we need to worship, as she did. Mary magnified the Lord. She worshipped and she adored him. She loved God with every fibre of her being. What God wanted, she wanted. When God asked, she answered. And full of the Holy Spirit, she went with all haste, not just to visit Elizabeth in the hill country of Jordan, but to do God's work. Now, a spirit of true worship, expressed in humility, a desire to kneel and adore, a desire to be fed by God's word and by the bread of heaven, the body, blood, soul and divinity of Christ present in every tabernacle in the world. And for us, poor sinners too, a desire to meet God in penance for sins committed and to be absolved and renewed in confession, regular and heartfelt. The paradox of true and humble worship is that it lifts us up and does not cast us down. It makes us great in loneliness. It spurs us to action so that having worshipped in spirit and truth, we go with great haste to do the Lord's work. The devil tells you that you can be whatever you want to be. God tells you that he has made you as you are and he loves you for it and wants your eternal joy. Second, that Mary accompanies us in prayer just as she stood at the foot of the cross and watched in unimaginable grief the death of her son, so she is with us in our joys, our sorrows, our hopes and our fears. Although herself cleansed of original sin from the moment of her conception, we, the baptised, are vulnerable to the temptations of the world, the flesh and the devil. The mantle of her prayers, the gentle mantle of her prayers, is cast about us and we, poor banished children of Eve, fly to her, a loving mother. And thirdly, and lastly, as we look with great sadness on the ways in which the grave sin, the gravest of sin, has inflicted terrible damage on our beloved church, and at very high levels indeed, Mary is a sign of hope. In what might be described as the passion of the church today, when we see so much conflict and division, and when we look with shame on such dreadful sins and crimes that have been committed, we can be sure that it will be her prayers, the mother of the church, that will enable Michael the Archangel to fight the enemy and prevail, and to enable the church to be renewed in humility and holiness. Mary's greatest weapons are her love and her purity. It is in the desire to strive in the grace of the Spirit for these mighty virtues that we too can find what it means to be truly great. May Mary's prayers be about us and may the Spirit which overshadowed her find a place in our hearts that we may worship God in the beauty of holiness and run with all haste to bring the good news that the children of God, even those still in the womb, may leap for joy. Amen.
Thank <laughs> you. 